Hello, and welcome to the darkness in the film industry, a Film Spark series. This is a series where I deep dive into the underbelly of the film industry to bring you facts and stories about the people you once knew and loved. This series is not for the faint of heart, and we'll be discussing what could be triggering topics. Warnings will be presented for each episode. This is episode two of Darkness in the Film Industry, Pier Paolo Pasolini. Warning topics such as indecent exposure of children and assassination will be covered in this episode. I am your host Ebony and let's get this started. Pierre Paolo Pasolini. Born the 5th of March 1922, Pierre was an Italian poet, filmmaker, writer and intellectual who has distinguished himself as a journalist, novelist, translator, playwright, visual artist and actor. He is considered one of the defining public intellectuals of the 20th century Italy, influential both as an artist and a political figure. Pierre was born in Bologna, traditionally one of the most politically leftist of Italy's cities. He was the son of elementary school teacher Susanna Colassi, named after her Polish Jewish great grandmother, and Carlo Alberto Pasolini, a lieutenant in the Royal Italian Army. And they had married in 1921. Pasolini was born in 1922 and named after a paternal uncle. His family Lee moved to Conegliano in 1923, then to Belluno in 1925, where their second son, Guadalberto, was born. In 1926, Pasolini's father was arrested for gambling debts. His mother moved with the children to her family's home in Casasa della Delizia in the Friuli region. In the same year, his father first detained, then identified Antio Zamboni as the would-be assassin of Benito Mussolini following his assassination attempt. Carlo Alberto was persuaded of the virtues of Italian fascism. Pasolini began writing poems at the age of seven. Inspired by the natural beauty of Casasa, one of his early influences was the work of Arthur Rambold. His father was transferred to Idria in the Julian March, now in Slovenia, in 1931, and in 1933 they moved again to Cremona in Lombardy, and later to Scandiano and Reggio Emilia. Pasolini found it difficult to adapt to all these dislocations, though he enlarged his poetry and literature readings, and left behind the religious fervour of his early years. In the Reggio Emilia High School, he met his first true friend, Luciano Serra. The two met again in Bologna, where Pasolini spent seven years completing high school. Here he cultivated new passions, including football. With other friends, including Hermes Perini, Franco Faralfi, Ilio Mili, he formed a group dedicated to literary discussions. In 1939, Pasolini graduated and entered the Literature College of the University of Bologna, discovering new themes such as philology and aesthetics of figurative arts. He also frequented the local cinema club. Pasolini always showed his friends a viral and strong exterior, totally hiding his interior turmoil. In his poems of this period, Pasolini started to include fragments of Rulian, a minority language he did not speak, but learned after he had begun to write poetry in it. I learned it as a sort of mystic act of love. Like the provincial poets. In 1943, he founded the fellow students of the Academy of the Frulian Language. As a young adult, Pasolini identified as an atheist. Paolo's Poetry and Writing in 1942, Pasolini published his own expense, a collection of poems in Frulian, which he had written at the age of 18. The work was noted and appreciated by such intellectuals and critics as Gianfranco Contini and Alfonso Gatto. Pasolini's pictures had also been well received. He is chief editor of a magazine called The Sieve, but was fired after conflicts with the director who was aligned with the fascist regime. A trip to Germany helped him also to perceive the provincial status of Italian culture in that period. 
These experiences led Pasolini to revise his opinion about the cultural politics of fascism and to switch gradually to a communist position. In 1954, Pasolini left his teaching job and moved to the Montreveda Corda. At this point, his cousin Grazila moved in. They also accommodated Pasolini's ailing father, Carlo Alberto, who died in 1958. His first novel was published in 1955. The work had great success, but was poorly received by a PCI establishment, and most important, the Italian government. It initiated a lawsuit for obscenity against Pasolini and his editor, Garzanti. Although exonerated, Pasolini became a target of insinuations, especially in the tabloid press. In 1955, together with Francesco Leonotti, Roberto Roversi and others, Pasolini edited and published a poetry magazine called Officina. The magazine closed in 1959 after 14 issues. That year, he also published his second novel, which, unlike his first, was embraced by the communist cultural sphere. He subsequently wrote a column for the PCI magazine Vinyuov from May 1960 to September 1965, which were published in the book form in 1977 as The Beautiful Flags. In the late 1960s, Pasolini edited an advice column in the weekly news magazine Tempo. In 1966, Pasolini wrote a screenplay for a never-produced film about the Apostle St. Paul, which he subsequently revised. Pasolini's screenplay was intended to depict Paul as a modern contemporary without modifying any of Paul's statements. In Pasolini's story, Paul is a fascist Vichy France collaborator who becomes illuminated while travelling to Franco Spain and joins the anti-fascist French resistance, an event which serves as the modern analogue for the Pauline conversion. The screenplay follows Paul as he preaches resistance in Italy, Spain, Germany and New York, where he is betrayed, arrested and executed. As philosopher Elaine Bader writes, The most surprising thing in all of this is the way in which Paul texts are transplanted, unaltered and with an almost unfathomable naturalness into the situations in which Pasolini deploys them. War, fascism, American capitalism, the petty debates of Italian intelligence. In 1970, Pasolini brought an old castle near Vertebo, several miles north of Rome, where he began to write his last novel, where he denounced obscure dealing in the highest levels of government and the corporate world. The novel documentary was left incomplete at his death. In 1972, Pasolini started to collaborate with the far-left association Lotta Continua, producing a documentary 12 Decembre concerning the Piazza Fontana bombing. The following year, he began a collaboration for Italy's most renowned newspaper, and at the beginning of 1975, Gazzanti published a collection of his critical essays. Paolo's career in films in 1957, together with Sergio Schitti, Pasolini collaborated on Federico Fellini's film, The Notte di Cabria, writing dialogue for the Roman dialect sections. Fellini also asked him to work on dialogue for some episodes of La Dolce Vita. Pasolini made his debut as an actor in Tugobo in 1960 and co-wrote Long Night in 1943. Along with Ragazzi de Vita, he had his celebrated poem Le Cineri di Gramsci, published, where Pasolini voiced tormented tensions between reason and heart, as well as existing ideological dialects within communism, a debate over artistic freedom, socialist realism, and commitment. Pasolini's first film as director and screenwriter was Acetoni, in 1961, again set in Rome's marginal quarters, a story of pimps, prostitutes and thieves that contrasted the Italy's post-war economic reforms. Although Pasolini tried to distance himself from neorealism, it is considered to be a kind of second neorealism. Nick Barbero, a critic writing in the Austin Chronicle, stated it may be the grimest movie he has ever seen. The film aroused controversy and scandal with conservatives demanded stricter censorship by the government, In 1963, the episode La Ricotta, included in the anthology film Droga Pag, was censored and Pasolini was tried for offence to the Italian state and religion. During this period, Pasolini frequently travelled abroad. 
1961 with Elsa Morante and Alberto Moravia to India, where he went again seven years later, and in 1962 to Sudan and Kenya. In 1963 to Ghana, Nigeria, Guinea, Jordan and Palestine. In 1970, he travelled again to Africa to shoot another documentary. Pasolini was a member of the jury of the 16th Berlin International Film Festival in 1966. In 1967 in Venice, he met and interviewed American poet Ezra Pound. They discussed the Italian movement, Neo Vanguardia, and Pasolini read some verses from the Italian translation of Pound's Passant Cantos. The late 1960s and early 70s were the era of the so-called student movement, Pasolini, though acknowledging the students' ideological motivations and referring to himself as a Catholic Marxist, thought them anthropologically middle class and therefore destined to fail in their attempts to revolutionary change. Regarding the Battle of Vargilia, which took place in Rome in March 1968, he said that he sympathised with the police, as they were children of the poor, while the young militants were exponents of what he called left-wing fascism. His film that year, Tiroema, was shown at the Venice Film Festival in a hot political climate. Pasolini had proclaimed that the festival would be managed by the directors. He wrote and directed the black and white The Gospel According to Matthew in 1964. It is based on scripture but adapted by Pasolini and he is credited as the writer. Jesus, a barefoot peasant, is played by Enrique Irizaki. For his 1966 film The Hawks and the Sparrows, Pasolini hired great Italian comedian Toto to work with Nanetto Davoli, the director's lover at the time and one of his preferred naif actors. It was a unique opportunity for Toto to demonstrate that he was a great dramatic actor as well. In Tirima or The Theorem from 1968, starring Terence Stamp as a mysterious stranger, Pasolini depicted the sexual coming apart of a bourgeois family. Variations of this theme were later done by Francois Ozon in the sitcom, Joe Swanborg in The Zone, and Takashi Miike in Visitor Q. Later films centred on sex-laden folklore such as Boccaccio's Decoramoron in 1971, Charles's The Canterbury Tales in 1972, and The Flower of a Thousand and One Nights. These films are usually grouped as the Trilogy of Life. While basing them on classics, Pasolini wrote the screenplay and took sole writing credit. This trilogy prompted largely by Pasolini's attempt to show the secular sacredness of the body against man-made social controls and especially against the venal hypocrisy of religious state, were an effort at representing a state of natural sexual innocence essential to the true nature of free humanity. Alternately playfully bawdy and poetically sensuous, wildly populous, Subtly symbolic and visually exquisite, the films are wildly popular in Italy and remain perhaps his most enduringly popular works. Yet despite the fact that the trilogy as a whole is considered by many as a masterpiece, Pasolini later reviled his own creation on account of the many softcore imitations of these three films in Italy that happened afterwards on account of a very same popularity he wound up deeply uncomfortable with. He believed a bastardization of his vision had taken place that amounted to a commoditization of the body he had tried to deny in his trilogy in the first place. The disconsolation this provided is seen as one of the primary reasons for his final film, Salo, in which humans are not only seen as commodities under authoritarian control, but are viewed merely as ciphers for its whims without the free vitality of the figures in the trilogy of life. His final work, Salo, or 120 Days of Sodom, in 1975, exceeded what most viewers would accept at the time in its explicit scenes of sexual perversity and intensely sadistic violence. Based on the novel 120 Days of Solom, it is considered Pasolini's most controversial film. In May 2006, Time Out's film guide named it the most controversial film of all time. Salo was intended as the first film of his trilogy of death, followed by an aborted biopic film about Gilles de Ray. The Darkness A small scandal broke out during a local festival in Ramachello in September 1949. Someone informed Cordovado, the local sergeant, of sexual conduct, or masturbation, 
by Pasolini with three youngsters aged 16 and younger after dancing and drinking. Cordovado summoned the boy's parents, who hesitantly refused to file charges despite Cordovado's urging. Cordovado nevertheless drew up a report, and the informer elaborated publicly on his accusations, sparking a public uproar. A judge in San Vito al Tagliamento charged Pasolini with corruption of minors and obscene acts in public places. He and the 16-year-old were both indicted. The next month when questioned, Pasolini would not deny the facts, but talked of a literary and erotic drive and cited Andre Guidi, the 1947 Nobel Prize for Literature. Cordovado informed his superiors and the regional press stepped in. According to Pasolini, the Christian Democrats instigated the entire affair to smear his name. He was fired from his job in Velfasone and was expelled from the PCI by the party's Udine section, which he considered a betrayal. In 1963, at the age of 41, Pasolini met the great love of his life, 15-year-old Ninetto Davoli, whom he later cast in his 1966 film, The Hawks and the Sparrows. Pasolini became the youth's mentor and friend. Pasolini was murdered, possibly assassinated, on the 2nd of November 1975 at a beach in Ostia. He had been run over several times by his own car. Multiple bones were broken and his testicles were crushed by what appeared to be a metal bar. An autopsy revealed that his body had been partially burned with gasoline after his death. The crime was long viewed as a mafia-style revenge killing, one extremely unlikely to have been carried out by only one person. Pasolini was buried in Casasa. Giuseppe Pelosi, then 17 years old, was caught driving Pasolini's car and confessed to the murder. He was convicted in 1976, initially with unknown others, but this phrase was later removed from the verdict. 29 years later, on the 7th of May 2005, Pelosi retracted his confession, which he said had been made under the threat of violence to his family. He claimed that three people with a southern accent had committed the murder, insulting Pasolini as a dirty communist. Other evidence uncovered in 2005 suggested that Pasolini had been murdered by an extortionist. Testimony by his friend Sergio Chitti indicted that some of the rolls of film from Salo had been stolen and that Pasolini planned to meet with the thieves on the 2nd of November 75 after a visit to Stockholm. Chitti's investigation uncovered additional evidence including a bloody wooden stick and an eyewitness who said he saw a group of men pull Pasolini from the car. The Rome police reopened the case after Pelosi's retraction, but the judges responsible for the investigation found that the new elements were insufficient to justify a continued inquiry. Still to this day, people debate on who's to blame and if there's more to what we know and see. However, there's one point everyone seems to agree on. Whether you liked his works or didn't, he left quite a legacy behind him. His Legacy As a director, Pasolini created a picturesque neorealism showing a sad reality. Many people did not want to see such portrayals in artistic work for public distribution. Mamma Roma, 1962, featuring Anna Magnani and telling the story of a prostitute and her son, was an affront to the public ideals of morality of those times. His works, with their unequaled poetry applied to cruel realities, showed that such realities were less distant from most daily lives and contributed to changes in the Italian psyche. Pasolini's work often endangered disapproval perhaps primarily because of his frequent focus on sexual behaviour and the contrast between what he presented and what was publicly sanctioned. While Pasolini's poetry often dealt with gay love interests, this was not the only or even main theme. His interest in and use of Italian dialects should also be noted. Much of the poetry was about his highly revered mother. He depicted certain corners of the contemporary reality as few other poets could do. His poetry, which took some time before it was translated, was not as well known outside Italy as were his films. A collection in English was published in 1996. Pasolini also developed a philosophy of language, mainly related to his studies on cinema. This theoretical and critical activity was another wholly debated topic. His collected articles and responses are still available today. 
These studies can be considered as the foundation of his artistic point of view. He believed a language such as English, Italian dialect or other is a rigid system in which human thought is trapped. He also thought that the cinema is the written language of reality which, like any other written language, enables man to see things from the point of view of truth. His films won awards at the Berlin International Film Festival, the Cannes Film Festival, Venice Film Festival, Italian National Syndicate for Film Journalists, the Jussi Awards, Kinema Jumpo Awards, International Catholic Film Office, and New York Film's Critic Circle. The Gospel According to St. Matthew was nominated for the United Nations Award of the British Academy of Film and Television Arts in 1968. That brings us to the end of episode 2 of the Darkness in the Film Industry series. My name is Ebony, this is the Film Spark Podcast, and thank you for listening. You were just listening to the Film Spark Podcast for all your film needs and more. Like what you heard? Give us a shot. Follow us on Spotify, Apple, Good Pods and more, or follow the socials at film underscore spark underscore pod. You know what? Just follow us on everything. Check out the link tree. Linktr.ee forward slash filmsparkpod. Find us, follow us, give us a shout. We always want to hear from you. You still here? It's over. Go home. Go. Oh.